Father, this is your word, and it's a strange story. It's a gross story. And yet as we turn to it, we know it is for us. For you've told us that this is life. Your word is life for us. And so we come and ask you to feed us. Give us what we need from your word. Father, I recognize that we are weak humans. I have no wisdom. I have no energy. I can't command or present anything in a way in which it would be attractive. My friends have problems hearing. (laughs) They are distracted. They too have trouble grasping some of the things that we hear. So we're going to need your spirit, Lord. We're going to need the Holy Spirit who gave these words to the writer to also come within us and among us and explain to us what we are reading. Help us to know what we are looking at. Help us to to be encouraged and empowered to leave here and do something with it. May it change us because it is your word and it is our life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the last major section of 2 Samuel. What happens in this passage is different than what has preceded. And I am going to address a little bit more about the organization of it next time. But it's in these first of six passages that we're going to be focused on today that have to do with the kingdom of God under David. This gives a picture of both the kingdom and the king in this section. And you see on the screen, it looks a little bit like this. We're going to be dealing with part A this morning, dealing with Saul's sin against the Gibeonites. Again, I'll say more about this later, but one of the things I would say is this section, as you can see by the outline, is very well organized. This this next section of Scripture is organized. And having said that, let's look more closely at our passage before us. (coughs) It says... Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. David sought the presence of the Lord, and the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them now. Uh, spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not the sons of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites, and the sons of Israel made a covenant with them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Now, just a quick reminder... Uh, We don't know when this happened exactly. Our author sometimes moves things around to keep things topical rather than working on a timeline. So when Saul did this, uh, or, or excuse me, when this famine happened, it's not really sure. By the time it's told here, though, Saul's been long dead. All right? It had to happen after chapter 9. But other than that, you can't be more precise. David is experiencing in the land a famine, as is the rest of Israel. His assumption is the weather is in the hand of the Lord. That's a good assumption because over and over again, the Lord claims he's the Lord of the weather, right? So that's a good thing to understand. But it was hard weather. For three years, there had been a famine. And in an agrarian society, three years of famine means people die. People die. And so God... God is in control of the weather, and people are dying. And David said, Lord, we need some famine relief. And God told David in a very gracious way, I think, God tells David, he reveals to him that this bad weather, this famine you're experiencing, is because of an injustice. See, Saul, while he was king, had killed an unspecified number of Gibeonites, and then many years had passed. Uh, But even though years had passed, God had not forgotten that injustice. He he had not lost sight of what had happened. And even though Saul was dead and gone, God remembered what happened. Now, I want to give you a historical reminder about the Gibeonites. Uh, The passage does somewhat, but I I want to just continue to jog your memory a little bit. About 300 years before this, in the book of Joshua, the Lord was bringing Israel out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land, and Joshua was leading them, and they were going into a land that was occupied by people. God had told Israel, go and move out the people. I'm giving this land as a gift to you, but more importantly, this is a judgment on these people. They're wicked. 
So you are to go in there, you are to displace them, and you're to live in their houses, you're to eat off their crops, you're to drink their wine, drink out of their water, and live their life in what's already made for you, I'm giving it to you. Now, as you can imagine, the people just didn't move out so the Israelites could move in. That's not how that works. It happened by violence. They didn't move by their own volition. And so there were three major battles that, that in which God led Israel to three great victories, and they were able to crush the back of the people who lived in their promised land. Now, to one extent or another, depending on where you went, they did occupy it. However, there was an interesting exception, because the people who live in Gibeon saw what was happening, and they knew when Israel rolls over us, they're going to come through here, kill us, and take everything we have. We could stand up and fight, but we ain't going to make it. <laughs> Let's work with trickery. Let's see if we can work this thing out. And so they decided to scam the Israelites, and before they could get to the town, the town came out, and it started marching towards the army. And, and they, they bumped into each other, and the Israelites said, hey, wh who are you and what you're doing? And they said, we're, well, we're from far away. We're just traveling through, you know. We don't live here. And they looked at the evidence, and the people had evidence that they had been on a long trip. And, and Joshua said, well, if you don't live here, we don't have a problem with you. You can keep rolling. We're not going to kill you. We're not going to go to war with you because you don't live here. And the Gibeonites said, can we get that on, in writing? Can we, can we lock this down? And they did. They made a covenant. They locked it down. We're not going to kill the Gibeonites. Well, it wasn't for a short time later they recognized they'd been fooled. These people just lived over the next hill. This was supposed to be part of their possession. And quite frankly, they made a bad covenant based on a lie. But there you have it. The Gibeonites get perpetual immunity. From that day forward, the Gibeonites lived amongst the people of Israel, and they lived in sort of a lower-class, indentured servant, slavery kind of position. They did the menial labor, but they got to live. And the bottom line quote comes from Joshua chapter 9, verse 18. You can read all about this in Joshua 9, but the bottom line is, the sons of Israel did not strike them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. They made a covenant and brought God's name in on it. That was the deal. However, 300 years later, thereabouts, Saul wouldn't keep the deal. The phrasing in verse 1 says he put him to death. And this implies that it wasn't a battle. It wasn't for legal reasons. They weren't up on charges and found guilty and, and executed in court. This wasn't capital punishment. It doesn't say how many he killed, but he killed some Gibeonites. Moreover, from the Gibeonites' position in verse 5, it says that they claimed he was trying to consume them, that he wanted to wipe them out. Gibeonites are saying, this is genocide. This is genocide. Saul broke the ancient agreement. Now, covenants ought to be kept. They ought to be kept if they're national promises. They ought to be kept regardless of the life of the king or the leader. They ought to be kept. They ought to be kept if they're old or they're new. They ought to be kept even when they were made uh, upon misinformation and deception. They ought to be kept. Israel should keep its word. The commitment should stand even if the person was untruthful. On top of that, they invoked the name of the Lord in it. Josh, in Joshua's day, the leaders were throwing around the name of God as if it didn't carry weight. Guess what? It carries weight. They invited God to be the arbitrator of the covenant. And so what happens when Saul breaks the covenant, guess what? God arbitrates. Why would Saul kill these Gibeonites? It doesn't exactly give the circumstances, but at the end of verse 2, it says something interesting. It says he was motivated by the zeal for the sons of Israel in Judah. You know what we call that today? Patriotism. Patriotism. With pro-Israel feelings in his heart, 
He crushed the minority that had an agreement to stay there. He tried to kill off the minority population. That's what the Gibeonites said. Think about that image for a second. As I thought about it, my mind started asking a couple questions. I wanted to know how should they have been treated? What should they have expected as a minority population of a different ethnicity, of a different religion, living in the kingdom of God at that time? What, what could they have expected? How did God want foreigners treated in his community? Well, quite frankly, there's a lot of information in the Old Testament that deals with that. But you have to remember that Israel at that time, there's a complete intertwining of national issues and religious issues. Today, we would say church and state were one. They were together. The national policies of Israel were the religion, and the religion was the national policies of Israel. Even the very calendar they used was based on God taking a rest. Whose God? Their God. Not the other gods, their God. Their whole culture was based on a specific God. So what happens if the whole culture is infused, complete mingling of church and state, how are you to treat people who live there but weren't a part of that religion, didn't have allegiance to that God? It seems reasonable to assume they would have little place in that culture. That seems reasonable. Moreover, the idea of foreigner is well represented in the Bible. It's called things like alien or sojourner. And it describes people who came for many reasons. Some of them came because they had to economically. That's the best place to go. Some of them were dragged into Israel in slavery. Some of them came because they wanted to do business. They were on an extended business trip that kept them there for months and months at a time. Some people came out of financial coercion, and some came out of financial freedom. All were guests who lived among them. There are, there are instructions about how you treat these people, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. First, they were to have equity under the law. Exodus says the law, same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. You are not supposed to have laws for the citizens and then laws for the strangers. Not in Israel. Secondly, it got down to religious type laws, Sabbath laws. Exodus 20.10 says, When on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, in it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male, your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who, who stays with you. God set you down to take a rest. You set other people down to take a rest. They had access to the cities of refuge. These were cities you could run to if you accidentally killed somebody. If manslaughter happened, it wasn't murder. You accidentally killed somebody. You got to run to a safe city where you got security and you got justice. Guess what? A foreigner could too. A foreigner could go in that city and have the same justice and have the same security. Even the underclass, Deuteronomy understands that it's easy to pick on the poor and the disenfranchised. And it says, uh, it, is, uh, it is the foreigners, it is the, the, the widows, the children, the foreigners, often grouped together, that need the protection of the law. Even your old enemies, this is interesting, Deuteronomy 23, 7 says, you shall not detest an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not detest an Egyptian, because you are an alien in his land. Edomites were unfaithful cousins, right? They were not religiously right. You know what? If, he li if there's an Edomite living among you, you can't look down on the black sheep of the family and treat him bad. But you know what else? The Egyptians used to be the slave owners of Israel. And so if an Egyptian comes and lives among you, you can't treat him poorly because his father treated your father poorly. You can't do that. And notice it uses the word detest. It's not talking about how you treat them. It's how you feel and think and your attitudes towards these people. You can't harbor detesting these people. Secondly, and granted this is very similar to the first point, they were supposed to get fair justice in court. Deuteronomy 1.16 says, When I charge the judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen, and judge righteously between man and his fellow countryman, or the alien who is with him. 
everyone gets the same justice, including justice to the poor again. You shall not pervert justice due to an alien or an orphan or take the widow's garment in a pledge. This has more to do with civil law. If somebody got sued, you could take some stuff from them, but you can't take everything so they can't live. You can't take away their ability to live by beating them in court. Number three, you can't oppress them. You should not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. See, justice is not only found in courts, it's found in other areas of life as well, particularly economics. Scripture comes back to this historical point time and time again. You were slaves in e Egypt. God delivered you from that. How dare you try to put somebody else in slavery like that? You cannot do what God has delivered you from. God says, I redeemed you for that, how dare you impose it on somebody else? Thirdly, aliens had a claim to benevolence. First of all, they had a claim to your love. When a stranger resides in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Our God is so funny, he will command who you love. Not just how you treat people, how you love people. He will command that. And you can't, you can't love a stranger differently than you do your people. That's not, that's not right. They had access to the gleanings. The gleanings means when a farmer would, would, would pick whatever crop he had, he's supposed to leave a little something on the edges, and the poor people had, had to come and pick it themselves, and they got to eat what they picked. You know what? That wasn't just for citizens. Anybody could come do that. You don't have to show a passport to do that. Everybody got to share in the goodness of God, the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, the widow are, who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. When God is good to Israel, he was good to the aliens who lived in Israel as well. All were to enjoy the goodness of God. They were to share in the feasts. The Hebrew calendar was full of feasts. Well, you don't have to belong as a citizen to enjoy the feast. They had Thanksgiving several times a year. And guess what? Everybody eats. Everybody dances. Fourthly, and this is related to number three, there are national and personal blessings that are available to the alien. Look, alien people, strangers, are invited into God's covenant in the Old Testament. Listen, there's, I'm going to read an invitation into the covenant of Israel. And in it, there's an idiom. It talks about the one who chops wood and draws water. That's the idiom for very hard work. That's what, that's what indentured servants did, right? They, they chopped wood and drew water. Well, when the, when the Gideonite scam was uncovered, Joshua said, you can live among us, but you're going to chop wood and, and haul water. All right? So, so listen to this. You shall stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs and your tribes, your elders and your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, the alien who is in your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which your Lord God is making with you today, in order that he might establish you today as his people, that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you, and he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's very interesting. God puts his attention on a specific group of a specific nationality and a specific race, but then he says everybody else can join too if they want. Right? They were able to offer sacrifices if they came into the, into the company of believers. Once you're converted into Judaism, you could keep the Passover. This was interesting to me. Everybody who lived in Israel had to go through theological and civil education. Deuteronomy says this, 31, 10 through 13 says, Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, so every seven years, this is repeated, every seven years, at the time of the remission of debts and the Feast of the Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place where he would choose, you shall read this law. Read the book of Deuteronomy. That's what he's saying. Read the book of Deuteronomy. And, and in front of all of Israel and all their hearing, assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, the alien who is in your town, so that they might hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of the law. 
Whether you agreed with it or not, you were going to Sunday school. That's what that means. You're going to learn about the Lord. You're going to learn about the expectations and how that fleshes out in the land. Whether you buy into it or not, you're going to get a religious, theological, civil education. You know why? We want you to know about God. And it doesn't matter what age, what gender, what nationality, what race you are, you're going to Sunday school. And you're going to come back in seven years and do it again. They were part of the covenant. When the covenant punishes Israel, it punishes the people who live with the Israelites. But this is what's interesting to me, and this comes out of a prayer in Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8. Listen to one of his prayers and what he says about strangers. This is a prayer. It says, also, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays towards this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls you to do in order that all the peoples of the earth may know that your name to fear you, to do as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this is the house which I have built is called by your name. This is a significant point. The mosaic is set, system is set up to welcome in foreigners and to help them assimilate in a manner. It wants foreigners to be a part of the group, but they have to do so in a manner. This manner cannot offend or minimize the righteousness of the one true God. See, it maintains that his calling and his values are within the covenant of believers. Aliens are welcome in, but they were not welcome to bring their former gods, their former systems of righteousness, or previous morality, or various types of worship. They were going to come in wholeheartedly and join worshiping this God. But you know what? The idea was when the foreigners come here, and they see what we've got, and we see what our God, and they see how God has blessed us, you know what? They're going to want to change. They're going to want to come and change. And you know what? Moses is going to let them. There's a way to do it. They had to learn how to do it. They had to enjoy what they saw, and they had to want to be blessed by the God who blesses Israel. But there's a way to do it. And it was expected that they would eventually want spiritual conversion, and social inclusion. That was expected. That's why Solomon can pray, Lord, when the aliens see who you are, when the foreigners check out who you are, they're going to pray to you. I want you to answer their prayers just like you answered mine. Just like you answered mine. Having given these four overlapping points, you have to be careful what you do with them. Some of you, since it's election season, are quite like, you're looking at America and you're saying, man, I wish we could aspire to this, right? Well, here's the point of Bible study. When the Old Testament says Israel, it does not mean America, okay? It means Israel, all right? And so, America's not Israel. Law, American lawmakers don't consider God's righteousness when they make laws. They don't worship the God who is when they make laws. They don't require you go to Sunday school education for the God who is when they make laws. Our laws don't appeal to God, nor his history, nor his actions, nor his virtue or mercies. They don't appeal to those things. God has not committed himself to deal with America any more than he has North Korea. A better, that doesn't mean this is meaningless to us, though. A better comparison would be to compare the believers in Israel to the followers of Christ. That's a better, a better comparison. They're not exactly the same, but it's a better comparison. Israel was called to God's righteousness and his values. Did you see his values when he was talking about the stranger? We worship the same God with the same righteousness, with the same values, but in a different context. Do we know his values towards the strangers? Absolutely, we do. We're called to be righteous but we live under different laws. Within these verses, we have the values of a God who never changes. These are pictures of what his righteousness looks like in that context. We don't live in that context, but these values ought to be embedded within our church and families. 
These, uh, these values ought to be a part of how we think and act towards those outside of the faith and outside of the community of believers, even people outside of our culture. See, at the heart of this is the description of how the spiritually and culturally alienated are going to be treated by God's people. That's, that's the question here. So if you heard about these four things that I just mentioned, and you want to change public policy at the state and federal level, you're mixing up biblical categories. But if you want to invite some new people around your Thanksgiving table next month, that's about right. This is not public pro policy as it was in the Old Testament. It's public policy in the Old Testament. It's personal practice in the New all these righteous principles about welcome and inclusion and instruction from the Old Testament ought to be considered, ought to be applied, ought to be administered by the church and the family of God. Just as the Old Testament addresses hearts and attitudes, these values ought not to be just a part of our sermons and church policies. They ought to be in our heart so that when those who are aliens in this life towards God, towards our culture, when they come across our path, I'm not going to treat them in a behavior that matches polite church policy. I'm going to treat them with the desire for their wholehearted inclusion that hopes and looks forward to their conversion. I want them to be thrilled by the same God who thrills me. Like Solomon, I want them to hear of my God. I want them to call on his name. And I want God to answer their prayers too, just like he's done for me. I want them completely, completely a part of the family of God. I want to move around my place at the table so they can sit. I want to be inconvenienced so that they can fit in. That's what I want. Why do I want that? Paul said never forget something. Paul said, never forget that at one time we were separate from Christ. We were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. We were the strangers to the covenants and to the promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, but now in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, we who were formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I want them at the table. I used to be away from the table. I like being at the table. I want them at the table. And if I have to scoot over and inconvenience myself, come on in. There's room. We know what it means to be alienated. We want full inclusion. Now, does that put in perspective some of the horror of what Saul did when he tried to clobber this minority people who was living among them. With patriotic fervor, Saul not only denies, but destroys the values of the kingdom of God. Now you see why God brought famine. You get it? Now we understand why a just God has to address an egregious crime. The horrible judgment of this chapter is based on a terrible injustice. David had to go into action. Verse 3 says, Thus David said to the Gibeonites, What should I do for you, and how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? This is a weird conversation. The king of Israel goes to this oppressed minority, and he says, How can we make this right? How can we make this right? How can this sin be paid for? He uses the word atonement. Atonement. How do we atone for this? What's it going to take so that you Gibeonites... We'll, we'll, we'll bless the Lord rather than cursing him based on what we've done to you. What's that going to take? Verse 4 says, Then the Gibeonites said to him, We have no concern of silver or gold with Saul or his house, nor is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. See, the Gibeonites said, For that kind of loss, there's no money. How do you put a price on that? How do you put a price on all the Gibeonites that were killed? The survivors said, There's nothing you can give us. There's not going to be an out-of-court settlement. Money's not going to rep remedy this. And Saul and his bloody house that attempted to wipe us out, what's he going to do? Are we going to wipe out the house of Saul? 
we know our position. We can't bring anybody to justice. We can't execute anybody in Israel. This is a waste of conversation. They're not, they're not after a vendetta. But they don't really think things are going to be addressed. And then David says, I will do for you whatever you say. And so they said to the king, the man who consumed us, who planned to exterminate us from remaining within any border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord of Gibeah and Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. Now, the results are that seven men from Saul's family were going to be turned over to the Gibeonites for execution. This is actually kind of normal. This follows legal patterns. See, if a person were going to bring charges and, and capital offense charges that require murder, then they were going to have to initiate the execution. You see, if you're going to bring a claim that this person ought to be arrested for a capital crime and you're going to bring the evidence, then what we're going to do is make you throw the first stone. Because if you're bringing false evidence or false testimony, guess what? You're the murderer. And you're going to stand before God. And so handing these men over to the ones making the accusation really falls right in line with how Hebrew legal system worked. Now this is foreign to us. Saul's guilty, and yet, and, and yet Saul's already dead. He's the guilty one. I mean, even in verse 1, the Lord himself says it's for Saul and his bloody house. And, and these seven men may or may not have had anything to do with that. It doesn't try to establish their culpability. They were the seven that were chosen. And, and so we naturally think, <coughs> if Saul did it, why are they paying? Right? And the Bible definitely teaches personal responsibility. You're responsible for your actions. You're responsible for your motives. You're responsible for you. But you know, at the same time, it also teaches that God works through representative structures. It, God works through relationships. See, Saul was both the head of the government and his family. Now think about this. He sinned but the nation paid with a famine. He sinned, but these men are going to, in his family are going to pay with their lives. See, kings are representative heads. The nation got into trouble because of their king as a representative head. David is trying to get them out of trouble as a representative head before the Gibeonites. Now, we sort of have something like this. I mean, we live under authorities, and when the head goes wrong, the body suffers. We get that. I mean, the people who declare our wars don't actually go to war, do they? In our system, Congress is supposed to declare a war. Don't always do it, but they're supposed to declare the war. When's the last time you saw a congressman suit up and go to war? It doesn't happen. They speak for us. And guess what? Other people militarize and mobilize and go to war and they die from the decisions the head makes. This sort of makes sense to us if we think about representative authorities. David agreed to their proposal, but there is an exception. Verse 7, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath the Lord of the Lord, which was between them, between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. You remember, David's best friend was Jonathan before he died. David promised to take care of his family. So he's not going to let Mephibosheth be a part of these seven. There is a guy named Mephibosheth who is part of the seven. It's not the Mephibosheth of Jonathan's son. It's a different one. Apparently, that name, as crazy as it is, ran in the family, okay? Saul, think about this, though. Saul may not have wanted to keep the promise of God, but David was going to make sure he kept his promise, right? Verse 8, so the king took the, son, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, Amari, and Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillia, the Mealoeth. And when he had given them into the hands of the Gibeonite, and they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord, so that the seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest. These seven were executed 
and then hung out to be displayed. This scene was very repugnant to a Hebrew. Deuteronomy 21 says, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he's put to death and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is accursed of the Lord. Hanging on a tree is a sign of being cursed. That's bad enough. Moreover, these dead bodies being left out there lead to ceremonial defilement. Therefore, Jewish people have historically buried their dead very quickly, usually within a day. See, if you couldn't be buried quickly, it's because nobody cared for you. Nobody was going to take care of you. It was a curse. Not being buried means leaving your corpse to the elements and the animals, which is another sign of abandonment. I don't know if you remember but when David and Goliath before they went into fighting, they were trash-talking one another. And, and Goliath said to David, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to leave your body out here for the animals to take care of. And a couple of verses later, David says it right back to him. I'm going to kill you and leave your body for the animals to take care of. It was a curse. And this explains what happens next. <clears throat> Verse 10, And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until it rained on them from the sky, and she allowed neither the birds of the sky to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. She was mother of two of these seven men. Of course, she was related to all of them. And she wanted to be sure that she loved and took care of them. So she dressed in her mourning clothes of sackcloth that she prepared for her, and she protected those corpses as best she could from the animals. Of course, this, is, um, this effort's very sad, and you and I might see it as very little consolation, but it was very important to her, and it was very meaningful for those around her as well. There's a, there's, there's a picture here of the ugliness of sin. These, this is the guilty family. And we have sympathy for them, and we should have sympathy for them. Because when somebody commits a sin, it splashes on a lot of people. It ripples on a lot of people. You're not the only one who suffers for your sin. And I know you have suffered for other people's sin. And even the sin that wasn't directed at you. When sin happens, it splashes indiscriminately on a lot of people. When it was told to David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done, then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the open square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them on the day the Philistines struck down Saul and Gilboa. He brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered in the bones of those who had been hanged, and they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zillah, in the grave of Kish, his father. Thus they did all that the king commanded. And after that, God was moved by prayer for the land. This, this whole thing is depressing. I mean, David has done what God has required. David has done what the Gibeonites required. David has done everything he can to make it right. He's, he's, he's given sympathy to the family of the guilty as well as the family of the innocent. And see in Rizba, David does what he can. He collects the corpses. He goes to another town and collects the corpses of Saul and Jonathan. He takes all of these, all nine of these, back to their home cemetery, and he buries them with their forefathers. He did what he could to, sell, to satisfy the claims of the aggrieved and to comfort those who had suffered loss, even the loss of the guilty family. And the last sentence says that God was moved to heal the land. The wrong was addressed. The atonement against sin, against the Gibeonites, was completed. And so ends the story. 
And I guess there's a sense in which there's resolution. <clears throat> there was a heinous crime, and it was atoned for. The required death was executed, and the bodies were eventually buried. The famine is over. So I guess this is justice. And yet at the same time, it seems pretty hollow, doesn't it? This may be justice, but it doesn't feel like resolution. It isn't peace, or, or what Jews would call shalom. This is not shalom. What do you do with this? Well, part of it, I think, is just to sit and think about the horror of the picture that is described here and to recognize how ugly things get sometimes and how awful they get and how life-changing, disastrous they get at times. Pulling principles out of a tragedy like this seems really cold. And yet, if you just sit here and emote over what you see, all you have is a hand-wringing tragedy. There needs to be something here to affirm. So I'll give you a couple things to think about. First, it seems to me we need these kind of stories. We need these kind of stories to remember that our theology is not cold facts. Sin is not a theological concept. Sin is not a psychological concept. In this case, it's genocide. It's the loss of life. It's death. And it leaves innocent people crying. It's not a theory or a category. It's horrible. And it ought to be hated. And if you don't hate what sin does, then you didn't sit with the Gibeonites, nor did you watch Rizba chase vultures off her family. Sometimes it takes a story to remind us what we believe. And what it means. Likewise, atonement's not a theological concept. What does atonement look like in this story? What, it, it's David sitting down with, with people and saying, how do I repay what can't be repaid? How can I make right what's never going to be right? How can I bring back deceased husbands and wives and children What's it going to take for you to bless God rather than to curse him for what we've done to you? Atonement's not a concept. Atonement is a, cost, a costly thing because it tries to cover a great guilt. Atonement takes sin seriously. You want to know how bad sin is? What does it take to fix it? Number two, God won't let sin slide. See, at the beginning of the story, the only one who cares what happened here was God. The only one who cared about what happened to the Gibeonites was God. David sat on it for at least three years. And the impression is, if the famine hadn't come, these murderers wouldn't have been addressed at all. But guess what? God's not going to forget it. And you know, I'm, I'm sure whether you lived in that day or whether you've read this story before, there's, there's something in your mind. It popped in my mind. Why don't you just let this go? Why don't you just let this go? Saul's dead. The people he murdered are dead. Let it go. But to say that is to turn a blind eye towards murder and genocide. It's to, be, it's to say, you know, these people don't get justice. They don't, you know, let's let it pass. You can't see that from my house. Anyone who says that has no concern for Gibeonites, no concern for the righteousness of God that wants to love and care for foreigners in the underclass, no concern for that. You can be sure that if you said, let it go, water under the bridge, you weren't the one victimized. You can be sure of that. Moreover, if you take this position, you reject the idea of institutional responsibility. 
You reject the idea of representational authorities. Can Israel be innocent just because Saul is dead? God says no. God doesn't think so. Societies, organizations, and families can't work like that. God won't let it happen. He won't let it go. You can't ignore the first verse that says it was God who brought the famine because of the injustice. You can't ignore the last verse that says God was satisfied by the atonement. This is God's doing. Three. All sin is before God. Now you can look at the human players, Saul, David, the Gibeonites, the executed seven, Rizpah. You can line up who offended who. But don't forget that it was God's sense of justice that had been offended and had to be appeased. He, atonement had to happen because of God. These sins are done in Israel, but every sin is worked out in heaven. Think about that. In verse 3, David talks about atonement with the Gibeonites, but the entire passage as a whole talks about atonement before God. It was God's sense of justice that was offended. It was his law concerning the sojourners and aliens that was broken. It was a covenant sworn by his name that was destroyed. In every sin, every sin, every sin, he's always the one aggrieved. The debt of sin always has to be paid to him. Whatever we do against our fellow man, we've done against God. Every sin we commit is Godward. Every evil thought, every evil disposition, every word, every deed, we pointed towards other people, we hit God. Next, atonement has always required death and bloodshed. Always. The atonement is costly because the sin is awful. It's got... As you look at what you see happening on that hill with those bodies, it's right to be appalled. It's always right to be appalled when you see atonement. It's always bloody and it's always disgusting. And it doesn't matter if it's bir birds, bulls, and sheep in Leviticus, seven men on, an, on a hill here in, Benj in the Benjamin area of Judah, or if it's Christ on the cross, atonement's always bloody. The wages of sin is death. There is life in the blood. And when the blood is poured out, life is spent. And when life is spent, atonement happens. That's how it works. Atonement is an attempt to address the wrong and to pay back the wronged. It's always costly and it's always bloody. We've seen this before. But by faith, we await justice and peace. This is another biblical reminder that though men may make every good faith effort, justice on this earth is never really done. Never. The best efforts, the best intentions, all the resources, justice is never completed. There are honest attempts, and yet they're all feeble. Real justice awaits to be done. Nobody can read this without knowing this doesn't make things whole. They're not whole here. There's no sense of peace. There's no sense of shalom. Obviously, this story makes us look for something better. A better atonement. A real replacement of what is lost. A land in which the alien is welcome, God's justice is satisfied, and justice leads to peace and wholeness. This story wants real atonement. It needs real atonement. And that's not available in a completed form here on earth. We await for the completed work of Jesus Christ to be evident among all of us. Jesus started it. He completed it. But it's not evident among us. But there's coming a day. There's coming a day in which the one true king, the son of David, the, the righteous judge, 
the one who gave himself for atonement will come and not only live out that atonement in all its richness, but also provide peace with it. And until then, all we have is a foretaste, a little bit of a taste, a little bit of an appreciation of what Jesus has done. We're thankful for that taste, but we are thirsting for something better. We are thirsting for something better. And though we are the family of God, Peter says we, we still walk around here like we're aliens. We know we don't belong here. This isn't right. It's not going to fulfill. It can't be made right. We look for something better. You get these glimpses of atonement. Bulls in Leviticus. Men on a hill. But thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for what he's supplied. Thank, thank God not only for what it accomplished, but also for the promise that goes forward from that. There's hope out there. Rizba, she has no hope. The Gibeonites, no hope. But Jesus Christ has done an atonement such that we not only look back on what he's done, but we look forward on how it, was, how it will be fulfilled in, in its accomplishment. That gives us hope. So we look at these situations that we're in now. We see how the injustices are done. We point to the problems within our criminal systems, within our, the behavior of our children, within, within the evil that is in men's hearts. And, and we see that very clearly, and yet we still have hope that someday Jesus is going to come back. And as, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, he's going, to, he's going to completely make this whole thing holy. Make this whole thing whole. Make this whole thing right. He's not taking it back to the garden. He's exceeding everything the garden would have hoped for. He's making the whole thing right, and then he's going to put it at the feet of his father, and it will be perfect. It will be perfect. And, and, and this, this, is how, this is how perfect it's going to be. Now think about the injustices you've seen. Think about the injustices you know about. When you get to heaven, and you see how God sees it, when you look back and are able to read the history like God read it, you're going to say, that, that was perfect. That was perfect. It couldn't have gone any better. We look forward to that day, don't we? Let's pray. Father, we, we have a desire in our heart for justice. We have a desire in our heart for peace. We, we, we hope... <laughs> We hope that we can look to institutions or individuals or situations that can quench our thirst, and yet we remain thirsty. And we know, because you have told us, that this can only be found in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to place all of our hope in you who provided him. Help us to work in this world as we ought, but to hope for the next. Help us to work in this world as we ought, but to invest in the next. Help us to work in this world as we ought, but to anchor ourselves in the next, where you are king to everybody's vision. Your glories are not hidden from anyone, and we all bow our knee and seek to serve you. We look forward to that day when you have not only beaten the mastery of sin with Jesus on the cross, but you've eliminated every presence of sin from our existence. May Christ come quickly, we pray. Amen. Stand with us this morning as we turn to...